Hello, everyone. Welcome to Trail Talk. I am so glad you guys could join us today. We have such a great guest here. This is LaQuincy Reed. LaQuincy is um, a sculptor. I'm, I'm not giving anything away. We've kind of got <laughs> We kind of got it showing here, but um, anyway, LaQuincy, it has uh, driven down from Oklahoma City today to join us on Trail Talk, so welcome. Thank we you. are super glad you're here. So we're set up in a different place today. We're kind of out in the um, uh, foyer of the Heritage Center, um, but that's because we're going to be moving around. So a little bit later in the show, you guys will see us walking places because we're going to go into the Garris Gallery and look at some other sculptures in there. So just a heads up, there'll be a little, you know, dead time, kind of. That's what I'm going to call it. We're going to call it dead yeah. time. So anyway, uh, okay, so look, Quincy, I'm going to get a little background information from you. So um, you our front you live in oklahoma now have you always lived here uh, i was born in oklahoma born in lawton oklahoma actually and my father was in the military so we moved around a little bit i lived in new jersey i lived in texas and i lived in hawaii mm -hmm. um, then we came back to lawton and i finished out my high school career with college and uh been working in oklahoma pretty much since then okay well, so since then. Yeah, so you've been here for a while. Yeah, I've been here most of my life. Yeah, okay. Well, it's a pretty good place to live. I like it. Yeah, exactly. Even even over Hawaii? Hawaii was pretty nice. I bet it was. <laughs> I bet it was. Man, I'm, nice. not, I'm not going to lie. I got, I got to go there one time, and my husband like was immediately pulling up Zillow to see <laughs> if there were any houses that couldn't afford anything. Yeah. Housing there is... Crazy, a little, expensive. Uh, a little expensive, but man, what a great, beautiful place to go. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, uh, how long have you were, were you always kind of interested in art? Was that something that you did as a kid? I mean, sculpting to me is not, I don't think, besides you know, Play Doh or clay as a kid, I, I it doesn't seem like it's an art form that you are like just do yeah. as a little kid so how, how did that start so uh, as a kid uh, i used to draw my, my grandmother's sun porch with my uncles mm -hmm. and uh, we would make our own superheroes we would draw superheroes and uh, that's how i began my art career is just drawing and then okay. uh, after i graduated high school and went to the university of oklahoma I was going to be a painter, but then I realized I was a really crappy painter. Ah. And I was working for a sculptor at the time after graduation. I was working for a sculptor and we were working on a monument. And I was learning all this information on how to be a sculptor. And kind of at that moment, I was like, you know, I'm not a very good painter. I'm learning a whole lot more about being a sculptor. I'm going to make that transition to being a sculptor. And I've been sculpting uh, exclusively for, you know, uh, 2006 2007 oh so for quite a while yeah so well so um did you just feel like you kind of had a knack for it did it just feel natural yeah to do that for what i was wanting wanting to do i was having a whole lot more success in that realm uh -huh. and uh yeah just i i guess i had a more of a knack for it than i did for painting mm -hmm. and uh you know so 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 producing art you have that thing in you that makes you want to create and produce art. Yeah, yeah, I always wanna to, wanna to do something. I'm always either drawing on something, doodling on something, or you know, fiddling with clay or mm -hmm. doing something. So do you sketch? Sometimes I sketch. I have a I have sketchbook school full of ideas. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll make a little model of something, and sometimes you just have an idea in your head that's just stuck in there for a while and you gotta get it out right away. So uh, how your ideas get out there is all kinds of things that happens. Right. So there are different kinds of sculptures because there are the kinds that are cast and then there are like people make them out of like marble mm -hmm. and things like that. Have you ever done these are all cast pieces. Yeah these are all cast pieces. Have you ever worked with marble or tried no. anything like that? Uh, I've worked with alabaster. Okay. And uh Actually, it was soapstone, not alabaster, was soapstone. Okay. And that's the most of the, the carving that I've done. Um, I find that when you work with clay, it's a lot more forgiving. So if I make a mistake and I make uh, a bunch of mistakes when I sculpt, 
uh, I can just, you know, tear it apart and then fix it. Whereas right. if it's in stone or something like that, you make a mistake. There's very little things that you can do to fix it. And uh, even if you do sculpt in stone or something like that, uh, there are very few people, unless you're doing a lot of abstract work, mm -hmm. if you're doing something more figurative, a lot of those uh, artists that do the figurative work even still sculpt in clay before they even translate it into something like stone. Ah, so the, so clay is clay is like the starting point. For a lot of people, it's not, it's not a hard, fast rule. So, you know, Everybody has a different working process, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, that it's a lot of uh, a lot of artwork and sculpture to get the clay. So you said you went to the University of Oklahoma. I guess you were studying art. Yes. Did you take sculpting classes? Yes. There. Yes. I was so you that. is that where you um, were first introduced to sculpting? Yeah, yeah. That's really how I learned. You know what sculpting was, and I didn't really know any, a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. And I was just taking sculpting classes and I really liked it. And I was doing that alongside painting. Uh, so. Yeah. Okay. So I was just kind of thinking about, you know, the basis. And then then you went to work and yeah. you were working for a sculptor. And yes. I bet that was probably the best education. Yeah, actually getting out there and, you know, seeing not just how to do things, but also the business aspect of it because uh -huh. A lot of artists, even myself, struggle with the business side of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing how that worked was very helpful. Right. So um, there was an artist. She's kind of an artist, and she makes jewelry. It has like these little moving pieces. Melissa Smith. Yeah. Uh, she uh, she was telling me that uh, there's like a Facebook group mm -hmm. of, and it's all someone teaches artists how to do the business side oh, really? of things. Yeah. And um, so. You're not the first yeah. artist who has mentioned that that is that is a bit of a struggle. Yeah, it's because you just don't you want to make stuff and you right. want to like fill out paperwork and yeah, that's that's the tough part. Yeah, I I can imagine. Yeah, I don't make paperwork. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, don't. My husband might see that. I didn't really mean that. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, so you've brought some clay and some tools and some things. So kind of. Well, uh, walk us through your process. How do you go from literally a lump of clay to something as detailed and beautiful as these pieces are? So the first thing you need to do is you need to have an idea. And once you have that idea, you need to build an armature. Your armature can be made out of wire. Okay, uh, wait, so tell me what is an armature? So an armature is basically the frame that the clay is going to hang on to. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, like on this sculpture here, there's a wire armature. It's just a wire going about right here, and then one for that leg, and then another one for that leg, and then a wire down here for her arm. So kind of a stick figure? Yeah, kind of a stick figure, and it's all kind of wrapped and wired together. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and is, is there a special kind of wire? So the wire that I use is uh, it's kind of an, it's an aluminum wire. Okay. And because it's it's got properties that lend, lend it to being very soft and malleable, but at the same time it can you know hold its shape, mm -hmm. and also it doesn't really hold that bad of memory. So if you bend like a wire, not a wire, but like a like a piece of metal, yes, it tends to want to not do anything other than that bend that you have. So the wire that I use has less of an effect. <laughs> we got. Few sound effects in the background there. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, My mom. Your mom is watching. <laughs> Kayla Quincy's mom. <laughs> We're glad you're on today. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't mean that. No. How are you doing? <laughs> good. That's great. <laughs> okay, so you start with this aluminum wire. Yeah. And is it a kind of larger gauge? Depends. Uh, for something like that, it'll be a little bit, maybe about twice as thick as a pencil lid, maybe. Okay. So somewhere around in there. Okay. Uh, maybe about as thick as a pencil lid. If you're doing something a lot bigger, you want to have thicker wire because it'll hold up the, the hold onto the clay a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on what you're working on. So you have that wire armature, mm -hmm. and that'll hold that'll hold hold the clay onto the uh, the shape and give it some stability. 
And then after you do that, you can start adding your clay. Uh, depending on what you're doing, I do a lot of figures. So a right, lot yeah. of, yeah, a lot of <laughs> referencing uh, anatomy, uh, trying to figure out what's going to look like in all directions and things like that. And then after you get the anatomy correct, you'll start adding the clothes, the folds, the wrinkles, and then the texture. And once you've done all that, you looked at it from 360 degrees and everything yeah. looks good, then you can move on to the next step. Right. So this piece has like this wall mm -hmm. um, behind it. Yeah. So is that going to be considered a relief? Yes, yeah, so this is going to be a really high relief. It'll be considered a high relief. Because it comes it, out so far? Yeah, it comes out so okay. far. If it was really low, uh, kind of like when you see it on a penny or a quarter. Or penny, oh, okay. That's a bar relief. If it's a really low line sculpture. Say that again. Bas relief. Spell that. B A S dash relief. Okay. Okay. I these are all new words that I am not familiar with. I'm loving so, this. Okay, so this is a high relief. Yeah. And okay. Um now did you did you make the wall part first? Uh or yeah. Uh I I had the idea of uh of a man talking to a woman and I wanted a back a backing on it. So just a piece of wood and another piece of wood attached on the back side, then packed with clay and okay. And then added the wire armature and uh -huh. you went from there. Okay, so what how do you how do you make all these details? I mean we're we I see like toenails on her toes mm -hmm. and you know the little whisk each the little whiskers on his mustache. Yeah. How do you do all of that? Uh, a lot of it's done with uh, trying to figure out what effect is going to work the best. Mm -hmm. So for something like his mustache, it might be just taking a little bitty tiny bit of clay, no, no thicker than uh, like the line of the pencil and just putting it there and just leaving it. Other times you might need to put it there. And, like individual? Uh, yeah, well, of. not individual, but when you look at something, you want to look at the mass. Uh -huh. So when we talk about the mass, uh, we're going to talk about uh, clumps so not just an individual hair but like what is the hair over what are the hairs overall doing uh -huh. so getting like that clump for that mustache in right so then after you get that clump for the mustache in you can start adding your texture uh everyone has a different working technique so uh, this is just kind of how i do mine right and uh <clears throat> just go from there just trying to figure out what's going to work best mm -hmm. laying in masses adding the texture and uh, what the tools I use uh, are some of them over here. There's a lot of wire and root tools. Mm -hmm. And these have little teeth on them. Oh, OK, yeah, I see that. So when you scratch or when you, not when you scratch, but when you, you scrape along the surface, it'll leave these lines. Uh -huh. um, to add like texture, yeah. and, OK. And then I just have these little wire tools like so. I have really even tinier ones than this. Uh -huh. And those allow you to either gouge out something that you need to gouge out. So if you're making an eye and it needs to go further back and be messed up, you can scoop out the eye. <laughs> that sounds a little weird, but yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, or you know, you can use it as even kind of a pencil and you know, uh -huh. draw in the different textures. Right. Uh, one thing that I also have is a knife. So I've had to actually had body parts in. The incorrect position. So I had to cut off arms, heads, legs, and reposition them. And it's just faster if you get there. If you just lop it off. Yeah. Just do it. And then one thing that's very important are a pair of calipers. Uh -huh. And what these do is they allow you to take measurements. And one measurement that's kind of fun and interesting, so I can demonstrate on myself, is like from your nose to where your ear begins. Mm -hmm. Is pretty much the same as from your chin to the bridge of your nose. Yeah. So like right there. Interesting. Right there. So we'll take different measurements that way. Um, to proportion yeah. the face. Yeah. Not just the face, even the arms. arms. So if I sculpt the That arms, is so cool. That is something that I did not know. Yeah. So these are really important if you want to have make sure your arms are the same length. Uh-huh. It's good to measure and make sure. Right. I mean, you're talking about anatomy and you have animals and people. Um, do you, did you have to kind of study anatomy? Do you have books that you refer to? Yeah. It's really 
I have a bunch of books that I refer to. Uh, when I was in college, I actually checked out a book from the library and I drew all the different muscles of the anatomy in that book. Mm -hmm. And I even did like an overlay. I drew a person with just the bones and then a person with the muscles and then a person with a, uh, with their skin. Uh -huh. And it was all uh, with tracing paper so you can see the bones and right. see the muscles on top. And that I did that on my own. Uh -huh. And that's kind of the, one of the ways that I work through trying to figure out my anatomy. I'm not perfect at it, but you know. Wow, that's so much, yeah. there's so much detail going into but um, I mean, you're exactly right. If you have to, you I guess it would probably, yeah. something like this would require more of that maybe than a painting. No, a, a painting requires just as much knowledge as anatomy. Uh, with sculpture, you got to make sure the anatomy looks right from 360 degrees. Mm, and then right. with painting, you got to make sure that everything looks right with the, uh, with the light, the color. Uh, the texture of what's going on. If he's wearing like a fur coat or something like that, it has right. to make sense on his anatomy. Uh, so there's there's different things that you have to worry about, mm -hmm. but there's still a whole lot of thought and you know effort and uh, thinking that's going on when you make a work. Right, right. Isn't that so cool? That I mean, to see how the the science of our bodies and all of that, how that feeds into the quality of the art than the finished product. I just, I like that. I think that's a really cool thing. Yeah. You know, um, so for those of you who are like science people or, you know, or you think you want to be an artist and science doesn't interest you, study your science because it's going to pay off. Yeah. And your math. Yeah. Your math is going to pay off too. Yeah. yeah. I have to, I've done, or I've done sculptures before where I've had to, make them bigger and when you make things bigger you have to figure out okay what's the rate of enlargement and you got to multiply everything and you got to measure and make sure mm -hmm. things are correct mm -hmm. so. so there you go there you go there's the case the case for math yeah. bailey no. that's it <laughs> all right so LaQuincy, um how long how, mu how many hours would you estimate you have put into this project so for so this far? one i've been I've been really struggling with this one. I've been working on this one for several months. Uh, not quite sure why it's been taking me so long to work to finish this one up, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of detail and it's, it's a high relief. So certain things look really good, but then they have to meld with the background and flatten out uh -huh. and still look like they're three dimensional with the background. So our, with that, that, that wall back. Uh -huh. So trying to get all of that to to work together has been a challenge just because I'm going from really high relief to an even lower relief that you can see like on his arm in that background. Oh yeah, right yes. Okay, and yeah, I see that now. The chair even uh -huh. is out there and then it's really flat. It's, uh -huh. So making that transition has kind of been tough. So maybe a couple of months on this. I'm not sure how many hours. Okay, well, a couple of months. I mean, that's a while. Yeah. Um, so is that, uh, is that different from the amount of time you would spend in a 360 yeah, kind of piece. I, like I said, I, I don't. Is this your first relief no, like this? I've done now? other reliefs before. Um, I don't know why this one's giving me a trouble. I, don't, I just don't know why. It's one of those things. Uh -huh. But uh, it's been giving me a little bit of trouble, but I like it. I like how it's going. Uh, right. For these guys, uh, normally it would take me uh, for a portrait head this size, maybe a week or so. Oh, okay. And then maybe a couple weeks and mm -hmm. not that long. Yeah. So um, are you a full-time professional artist now? Now I am. <laughs> now you are. So yeah. it, that has taken some time yeah. for you to uh, get there. Yeah. Is that Has this always been the dream to be the full-time? Yeah, that's always artist? been the goal. I was an art teacher for about nine years in the public school system. And uh, yeah, just this past year, I decided to step out and starting to mark full time. Mm -hmm. So things have been going well. That's great. That is great. Okay, so um so this is like step the first part. Yep. You create the yep. in with the clay. Yes. And then what do you do next? So after we've done that, we'll make a rubber mold. And the rubber mold will be really floppy or whatever. And after we make that rubber mold on that clay, so this clay would be covered in this orangish pinkish stuff mm -hmm. 
And after it's covered in that orangish pinkish stuff, uh, we make a plaster shell. And then after I make a plaster right shell, over the top yeah, of it, just right over the top of it. And that helps that rubber, like I said, that rubber is really floppy. Oh, uh, it gives it some rigidity. Yep, and it helps it hold, it helps it to hold its shape. Uh -huh. And then once we've done that, uh, it'll follow the lost wax process. And I'm going to give you the super, 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 super easy version of it. Lost wax <laughs> yeah, process. Lost wax. Okay. And I actually even have some of the wax that they used when they poured it in here. So, okay. Uh, it's just wax. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. This is like extra wax. But okay. anyway, they'll pour wax in here and they'll make it about, you know, about that thick, about okay. as thick as a nickel. Okay. All the way through in there. And after they paint the wax in there, they'll so they apply it yep. with a paintbrush. Uh, and who are wait, who are they? So the foundry. The foundry. The foundry. Okay, the foundry. take it to a foundry. So yeah, they'll uh, they'll put it together, put the mold together. After it's painted in there or filled up. Yeah, they'll put the mold together and it depends on how they do it. Some uh -huh. people they like to paint it in there, some people they like to pour the wax in there, slosh it around while it's still hot, uh -huh. and then pour it out. And do that three, four, five, maybe ten times. Okay, to so make layers yeah. of it. Yeah. Is it is it a different kind of wax from uh, like candle wax? Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit. It's a little bit more sturdy. Uh huh. Uh, okay. It's a little bit. I guess. A little Brittle. Bit, yeah, it's not very flexible. Uh huh. So. Uh, but that's what you want. Yeah, you want something that's going to hold up that rigidity, and then uh, yeah, just a little bit tougher, not so soft. Uh, as like a, like a candle wax or a beeswax or something mm -hmm. like that. So after they do the wax, they'll cover it with a ceramic slurry on the inside and on the outside. So it's just going to be a, a thin layer of wax covered by that ceramic slurry. And what the reason, is a slurry? It's just kind of a runny kind of a, a runny battery kind of, not battery like a battery, but yeah. like, like cake batter. Okay. A like cake batter kind of ceramic slurry. So it's kind of like uh, uh, what you use for like ceramic clay. It, it's it's not that exactly, but right. it's similar in that way because it can absorb the heat really well. Okay, that's what I was yeah. okay wondering because a foundry, they're going to ultimately pour hot metal yeah. into this mold. Yeah. So I'm thinking, how are you going to keep any part of that from getting too hot and losing its shape. Yeah, well, well yeah, that's why it's called the lost wax because eventually. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just, the camera does that eventually. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's called the lost wax because once we get it covered with that ceramic slurry, they'll melt away all that wax. And once they've melted away all that wax, you'll have uh -huh. a void inside with uh, where the wax used to be. Right. And they can pour that hot bronze in there. And once they pour that hot bronze in there, uh, they let it cool off and they break away the ceramic and you have your bronze piece. So you can even see that oh, it's kind of hollow in there. Wow, can you can you see, you that? see that? Yeah, well. there you go. Yeah, you're, yeah, it is hollow right there. Yeah, that that you can see so how it's about as thick as a, as a nickel. Uh -huh. a, little bit thicker. a little bit thicker than a nickel in some yeah. parts, it looks like. Yeah. Wow, that is so cool. I had no idea what that process was like. And so that's the lost wax yeah. thing. They heat it up and get that wax out. Yeah. So how do they know they got it all out? How do they know they got all the wax out? Yeah, because that would mess it up, wouldn't it? Yeah, but they I think they heat it up well enough and they have it's they have a sprue system, so uh sprues and gates and everything like that, so the wax can free flow out. I don't, what is a spring? Uh, so I have so many <laughs> questions today. <laughs> I so, should have studied this no, a little bit. Sprues are just kind of areas where they connect <laughs> and places that the wax can kind of flow out and the bronze can flow in when you pour it. Okay, okay. So that's that's what, that's basically what it is. Okay. All right. So wow. And so then how long before the bronze is set? And you can they can take the mold off. Uh, I'm not sure how long we have to let it cool. Um, depends on the piece. Uh -huh. For something bigger, you you don't want to you don't want to cool down too fast, but you do want to kind of cool down kind of slowly 
so that the, there's no thermal shock in the, in the size of it, you know, crack or break or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, depends on the piece. So is this the, is it the same process regardless mm -hmm. of the size of the statue? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty I'm much. just thinking about this, the giant. Yeah. Uh, big statue that we have mm -hmm. out front yeah. mm -hmm. and what kind of a process that would yeah. have been. They'll cast each piece. Uh, they'll cast not the entire thing as one whole piece. Right, but still each horse yeah. and the there's part of it's a relief. Yeah. Um, is a whole relief, is that one? No, they would probably cast it in sections. The and casting then, session well uh, everything together and, uh -huh. and then, uh -huh. yeah. would this be done all in one thing for this this is so small uh there might be one or two things that they might have to you know cut off and weld back on and are cut off and do the lost wax process separately mm -hmm. there might be a couple of things but for the most part it'll all be cast as one whole piece and so here's the here's the thing that blows my mind is that you as the artist just hand over your yeah what's your mold your thing and then the foundry finishes that process of making it's yeah. like total trust yeah well you, if you, you have to make sure you have a good foundry uh, I guess they have a reputation. Yeah. For yeah. Being. Yeah. You can you can tell if it's a good foundry if you, if you keep your original clay. Uh huh. And if you look for like certain marks on the original clay, and they're still there on the finished yeah. ones, you know you pretty much got like a, a really good foundry. Right. So. Right. Very interesting. And so, um, tell us. Uh, well, first of all, I want you to tell us what you do with your clay after you get, I guess you wait until your bronze is finished yeah. and return to you. And then what do you do with your clay? Uh, chop it up and reuse it. Because <laughs> the clay I use isn't the water-based clay, it's uh -huh. oil-based and uh, this can't be the finished product. So I can't fire it. Uh, if I try to fire it, it'll just melt. Uh -huh. So uh, this will never be the finished product. Uh, the casting, the bronze, whether it's bronze or plaster or some other material. Right. That's the finished product. This is a step in the way to get to the final product. And so just how many, how many pieces have you had cast at a foundry, would you say, over the years? Oh, maybe 30 or so. 30 oh, really? 40, something like that, yeah. Now, um, earlier when we were talking, you said something about um, that you you keep this because there you might make more than one of uh, a piece. Kind of talk about that. So we keep the mold because uh, in general, I won't say all ours, but most ours, we do an addition mm -hmm. of, our, of our castings. Uh, and that addition just means that we'll have uh, multiple multiples of a work of art and uh once you finish doing all of your castings uh that addition is done mm -hmm. and uh let's just destroy the mold after that okay. and a, a lot of printmakers do this uh there's mm -hmm. rembrandt's he was a, a printmaker did etchings and uh what they'll do is they'll actually score and scrape all over their their etching plate because that addition is done. There's no more. So, and so no one else could ever find yeah. it and recreate. So <clears throat> we uh, there's a, a not a very big, I mean it's a little bit long, a uh, little statue down by the theater mm -hmm. here. We were talking about that. And I went down there and looked at it, and it was actually 100 of 100. Mm -hmm. So that means that they recreated that same piece 100 times. Yeah. And so then that piece that we have is the 100th one. Yeah, that's the that last one of that edition. The last one. Yeah. So when you hear numbered, uh, it's a numbered mm -hmm. uh, edition. Is that yeah. what you would call it? Um, and I've seen those on prints and things where it's like, you know, five of, you know, 10 or yeah. whatever. So that's that means that it has more value than one that's probably not numbered. Yeah, well, and, you know, yeah. as far as if a collector's kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, you want the. Uh, if it's not numbered, you got to question kind of the authenticity because uh, when you're doing multiples of work of art, 
there's going to be an addition number. There mm -hmm. has to be a certain amount that you plan on making. Mm -hmm. And then there has to be one within that number of ones that you're making. Yeah. In order for it to uh, be part of that addition. Right. So um, what is your what is your inspiration? What what kinds of things are you um, do you really like to create? So I really love uh, sculpting human figures. That's uh, that's that's one of my favorite things to sculpt. Um, here recently, I've been working with Blacks in the West, mm -hmm. and I've been working with a lot of uh, themes on Black culture in the West and you know, how Blacks have influenced the West and how they've been influenced in the West and the history related to Blacks in the West. Mm -hmm. And that's what the majority of my work has been centered on recently. Okay, so um, that's, and so is, is this, uh, this obviously is a, African American couple, but he is wearing kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, he's got boots and a hat, kind of a Western apparel. Is this like a, a black cowboy kind of, or just a, a, a Western? So this is actually, he's not African American. He's from the oh, Congo. Oh, okay. From uh, where? The Congo. Oh, okay. And in the Congo, there were a group of, uh, this, this is a culture developed around the West. Mm -hmm. um, the missionaries okay. were showing people in the Congo a lot of westerns, and they, like they, Western movies. Yeah, Western okay. movies. Uh, Buffalo Bill. They're, so they were really influenced by what they were seeing in the movies, and they developed a whole culture developed around Western culture, and uh, very masculine and, right, and that yeah. type of deal. Yeah. And you know, they, they were bodybuilding and <laughs> into all these kind of things to to kind of show their their masculineness and. Mm -hmm being involved with uh, Western culture, that culture was part of it as well. Interesting. So he's actually, uh, what they call themselves were Bills. He was, he's a Bill from the Congo. And I have uh, a woman from the Congo dressed in a traditional yeah. dress, yeah. Uh -huh. And he's kind of trying to smooth talk. Right, yeah, you can see he's got yeah. <laughs> so, the stance going there. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's that is very interesting. That is yeah. a historical thing I I did not know about. Yeah, so it's not that's just a, yeah, it's not just African Americans. The Western culture has influenced a lot of places. Well, true. Those Wild West shows, yeah. like when you said Buffalo Bill, you know, Will Rogers traveled all around the world yeah. performing in Wild West shows yeah. that you mm -hmm. know people I guess just flocked yeah. to watch you know, watch him lasso something, you know, watch people do tricks on horseback and yeah. things like that. But I hadn't thought about that influencing a culture to the degree that they emulate yeah. that look, you know, they yeah. take on that, the dress, the yeah. apparel and everything. So yeah. very interesting. And so these pieces uh, are, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was just saying, uh, asking. So these are kind of describe these that you brought with you. So this is a piece called Don't Push Me, and it's uh, a black cowboy from uh, the American West. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that the West wasn't just, you know, a place that, uh, it, it was a place where you could actually, you know, survive and thrive and make a living for yourself. And that was especially true for, for Blacks in the West at that time, because a lot of them were slaves, and then they were free, and, you know, you had a choice. You could either, you know, Travel up north. You can stay where you're at mm -hmm. and actually, you know, continue working on your farm uh, or the plantation right. at the time, or you could move west and find, you know, economic freedom. You were free. You're out on the open range. Mm -hmm. uh, there was very there's, there's still discrimination, but there's a lot less discrimination because everybody was just like, can you do the job? And you can do the job. You know, with a care. Right. And so we there's some estimates that say about a quarter of cowboys were black. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, He's cowboy out in the West and, you know, he's got his gun tucked underneath him and, mm -hmm. you know, he's still aware of the fact that there's discrimination, people that might want to harm him or whatever, but right. at the same time, you know, yeah, he can he's, protect himself. Yes. Yeah. That's, and he kind of has like a cavalry type. I mean, this looks like almost like a, you know, the, the military. Mm -hmm. The horseback riding. Yeah. The, I mean the the shirt kind yeah. of style right there. Yeah, that's which the, there were a lot of uh, soldiers. Yeah. 
um, who were once the, once the Civil War was over, mm -hmm. they were um, had joined the army. Yeah, basically, I guess. And so that's so. that's kind of what this other one is. Oh, uh, this one here. Yeah, and that's a of a, of a Union soldier, uh -huh. a Buffalo soldier, and uh, for that one, I was thinking about how big of a transition it go you go from you know one one moment you're you know you're enslaved and then the next moment you're a soldier mm -hmm. charged with you know protecting the union yeah. and that's got to be such a big transition and just a huge jump from one lifestyle to another so uh he's kind of mm -hmm. i wanted to kind of capture that feeling with him transitioning from one lifestyle to the next mm -hmm. you know and showing that with him being on his horse and right. it's kind of a little bit out of control his foot's out of the stirrup and he's mm -hmm. kind of yeah diving head first into it yeah well a, a lot of movement on this mm -hmm. piece you know a lot you can see the mane of the horse the tail everything even i mean he's hanging you know yeah. hanging on that's a that's very a very nice piece and i like the finish of it do they do you have them do this at the foundry at yeah, the Tina. finish uh -huh, with yeah. Tina? Yeah. Yeah, they'll say, what patina do you want? And I'll say, well, what patina do you guys think we should do? And we'll talk back and forth maybe a little bit. Uh -huh. And we'll go from there. And maybe uh they'll have an idea for me. And maybe I'll go with that. Maybe I'll have an idea from the outside offset and we'll go with that. Right. Just kind of depends on the piece. Mm -hmm. Nice. The horse, yeah. When you tell, when tell us about the horse here. Uh, so with that horse, I was mainly focused on just trying to capture uh, different emotions and in, and in, in horses. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah, they have a lot. Yeah, and for this one, I was just kind of trying to capture a horse that uh, was wild and is still not completely broken, and just trying to make him look like he's he's on the edge and. Mm -hmm of being tamed or untamed. Right. And yeah. so that's that's kind of what I was focusing on now. He's got that he's got that edge to him yeah. still. All right. And then this piece. For that one, I did that one at the Buffalo Bill Show, the Buffalo Bill Art Show and Sale in Cody, Wyoming. And so it, like you've created it there? Yeah, is what okay. they call a quick draw. So oh, I sculpted okay. it in clay in an hour and a half. And oh. then after I sculpted it in clay, it's been about an hour and a half on it. They uh they bid on it and I sold about yeah. what, like six seven eight something like that of the addition the addition is no uh -huh. more. Oh really? Yeah. So that one the mold has been broken. Yep. That's this... oh that's where that comes from. <laughs> yeah. The mold is broken because it's okay. So wow. That's that's where that one's from and uh, that's actually an artist proof they give us a, a a copy of one of them. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. Sunshine in, yeah. so kind of face up to the sun, yeah. and wow, that's a great, that's a beautiful piece. Thank you. Yeah, and then this last one. So this is of my my brother Alexander Reed. Uh huh. Uh, it's not important that you guys know his name. But. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to him. Yeah. yeah. So at the time. And your mom. Yeah, your mom might think it's important. <laughs> So at the time he was uh, he was playing football at Southern Nazarene University, uh -huh. and I just thought it was kind of a, a cool deal to to show an athlete, you know, after working out or something like that, right? Just kind of relaxing, you know, toweling off. So, mm -hmm. so that's the that's this guy's towel around mm -hmm. his neck here, yeah. and mm -hmm. young athlete. Wow. Well, those are so cool, and I just can't even imagine. Uh, I mean, the, the, your work is is really stunning. Thank you. I mean, the the detail and just the there's so much. And I it, it sounds like you do a lot of background research and studying, you know, history and cultures and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, all of that just adds to the story yeah. and adds to the value. And owner of a piece of this would own. To be able to share that story when mm -hmm. they share that piece with someone and that's that makes some uh, something really great yeah i try to do as much research as i can i'm still learning about things and uh, one thing that interests you 
it just kind of takes you down a rabbit hole of different ideas and i say yeah. that almost every day i go some, down some rabbit hole that i'm looking something up and then yeah. i'm gone yeah. for about an hour and it's like yeah. okay i gotta come back i know exactly what yeah. you're saying so you find out all kinds of i didn't know anything about the the bills of the congo and i don't even know how i found out about them i was just researching and, and looking at things and came across them so what a great story yeah. though and not one that your typical someone from the u.s might know yeah you know but i mean what a, a, a cool way that cowboy culture stretched around the world yeah you know that's really that's a that's a great story i love that that's probably something i'll go down a rabbit hole on <laughs> later on <laughs> well um so we're gonna we're gonna take a few minutes and we're going to kind of move around a little bit because we're going to go look at some pieces here and um you know he La Quincy's done research and studied other artists and so we're going to look at some of the sculptures that we have in the Garris gallery and he's going to give us a little little background little information on it so you guys kind of hang with us for a minute we'll be uh we'll be right back we're just going to move down over here I got the can. You want that? Yeah, and I'll get the other one. It just crashed. Yeah. So getting in my way. We got you. Yeah, y'all can still see with Lindsay. He's doing the backwards walk right now. Light. Come on, a little closer. Look at that, Bailey. There we go. Stood back. Okay. Um. So this this is a piece by someone named Buck McCain. Mm -hmm. So, and we didn't know this. This is gets you the serious three hundred and sixty. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, mounted on like a lazy Susan, which yeah. is super cool so talk to us about this so like i said this is a buck mccain it's called coal oil meets bones mm -hmm. bones is the guy riding the, the horse and he's actually a a black cowboy okay yeah spin that around where people yeah. can see oh look at that yeah he has like a confederate soldier cap in his hand yeah isn't it so interesting one thing that I really liked about this sculpture, and I want to talk about it, was the composition. So you can see how it kind of makes like a crescent almost. Yes. Uh huh. And that just kind of makes for a really interesting sculpture to look at. It even kind of twists along with that crescent. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it's very rare that you see uh, blacks represented in in Western art, mm -hmm. even though there there's a, there was a good amount of, of blacks in the West right. that were working. And those that twenty five percent number, I yeah. think would would be a surprise yeah. for people who didn't really know that. Yeah, a lot of people I, I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 great because of the composition, and then it's great because we don't see very many black cowboys in the West. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's kind of an interesting, the different, different take on Western art. I, I don't know if it's different, but you know, it's, it's, it's something that you don't see. Every well, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's not as common yeah. as, um, mm -hmm. you know, a native American yeah. or a Caucasian cowboy or whatever. Yeah. Um, even, um, Mexican cowboys yeah. are probably, uh, portrayed more in movies or art than um, a black cowboy. So um, 
now that you described using the wire, mm -hmm. I can see a wire would absolutely be necessary to make something like this, wouldn't it? To be able to get that structure to yeah. curve around and hold the clay yeah. out there yeah. on that. Yeah. Have, so, so the, and what did you call that? The curve, you called it a... Oh, it looks kind of like a crescent. A, yeah, like a crescent. Yeah. Um, and so is that kind of a a technique uh or is it just something that this particular artist maybe did you know what I'm, i yeah. mean well when you, when you when you make a sculptor a sculpture when you uh -huh. make a work of art you want to encourage somebody to walk around it in 360 degrees uh -huh. so with that kind of crescent and it doesn't just do the crescent it almost twists around so if we follow these kind of lumps uh -huh. to the horse's head, to uh -huh. the mane, up to the hand, up to his head, All up there. The way. So it almost twists and it invites you to kind of look around it yes. instead of just wanting to look at it from one spot. Yes. So those are the, that's that's really the the most interesting part is that he's encouraging you to to look all the way around at mm -hmm. the artwork by getting that twist in there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And I, I'll be honest, I've never stopped and looked at the detail on this, but he even has like the leather on the saddle. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's been tooled. Yep, he's got tooling on the leather. Uh -huh. They've got the reins, they've got uh the head, the head stall has little embellishments. So would this have been the reins? Would would this be cast? More than likely, it would be uh just strips of bronze that were welded on there. Okay. That's what it looks like. Okay. Okay. But here again, I mean, the the arms being mm -hmm. the right proportion, the legs being the right proportion, but a horse not looking too big or too small. You mm -hmm. know, there's, I, I can see all of those things you were talking about um, and how you really, he, the artist really had to put all of that detail into it. Wow, this is a very cool piece. See. And so this guy, well, he's still, he was, he's he's still he's living. He's Have still you met him? No, I've not met I've not met Book King. Uh-huh. No. But do you admire his work? Is he someone that you have yeah, I, he's, he's studied? Yeah, he's very talented. Or, he's very uh -huh. talented. Yeah. Cool. Is he do you know where he's from? I believe he's from California, if I'm not mistaken. Interesting. Okay. All right. I think he so, might stay on here. Yeah, oh. I was looking to see. Yeah, uh, yeah, Cal Ranger, Ranger, California. California. Yeah. Nice. Okay, we're going to move on around to um, one of the bigger pieces that we have here at the in the gallery. This is cool. I like it where we have this oh, one right positioned here. because so it's here. right here, kind of welcoming everyone as they come into uh, into the Garris Gallery. And I, this piece is so impressive. Yeah. Especially now that I understand more about it. <laughs> so this is actually one of my favorite sculptures that's here at the the Heritage Center. Uh, this is a Geronimo. It's by Mark uh, Martinson. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Geronimo is buried here in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, he was an Apache and he died as a prisoner of war. One of the things that he kind of regrets is that he ever surrendered. He even said that, that, that you know, as he was dying, he said, you know, mm. I shouldn't have surrendered. You know, I should have fought until I was the last, last man alive. Well, uh, because of, I mean, Native American culture, dying as a prisoner to white man, mm -hmm. It's probably one a great humiliation yeah. for him, and he was a chief and dying in battle was a much yeah. higher regarded way to die, I guess. He uh, he's he's kind of a, he's kind of controversial. Um, a lot of from what I've read is uh, a lot of people were were really tired of doing all the fighting. It was it, there was so much death and everything. Mm -hmm. He was fighting the Mexican government. He was fighting the American government. And they everyone was just wanting to, you know, settle down. Like 
The other Apache. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 the Chiricahua yeah. Apache, I believe. Yeah. It's kind of controversial in that respect. Mm. But when we think about Geronimo now, we don't, I don't know if we, I don't know how we contextualize him now, but I think, you know, him being a strong and fierce warrior is more important when we think about when we think about Geronimo. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really enjoy about it, it just feels like it's just this massive monument. And as you can see, he's not, <laughs> he's not that big, but he feels so big because of his massiveness. Like, he just mm -hmm. he feels regal and royal even in surrender mm -hmm. and he captured all of that in the sculpture and it just it, it's one of my favorites that's here mm -hmm. and it i mean it is very large and so the same process though yeah would have been used for this yes I just don't you guys find that fascinating now that you know more about it. I mean, I think that is really cool, and so much detail yeah. has been uh, really put on this piece. And you do because it's so big. You do walk all the way around this yeah. and really um, admire it. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that is that is a cool piece. Okay, we're going to move back here to uh, we have a couple of reliefs. Here in the gallery. Go back a little bit there with the camera. The lens up. Like that. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Stop. This is a John Coleman piece. It's called a uh, song for the spirit. And as he was saying, it's a relief. Uh, one thing that's really cool about this is I didn't know that John Coleman had done any reliefs, or not reliefs, uh, I didn't know he had done any resin castings. So this isn't bronze, this is actually a resin. And you know what a resin is? A lot of times it's a, uh, uh, a artificial plastic petroleum, some kind of mixture of some kind of chemicals that's uh, UV resistant and and long term. And so this is what this casting is. And like I said, I, I haven't seen any resin castings by John Coleman. So this is interesting for me in that respect. Uh, also, John Coleman is a part of the Cowboy Artists of America. He's also a member of the National Sculpture Society. And recently, he's been doing a whole lot more painting than he has been doing uh, sculpture, sculpting, from what I can tell. Right. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that kind of transition from strictly being a sculptor to doing more paintings. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've uh, kind of, in uh, interviewing artists, it seems like um, everyone kind of reaches a point where they push themselves to go try something else. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of waiting now to see what you end up, Kind of chasing. Yeah. You've already dogged yourself as far as being a painter, which <laughs> I have a feeling he's his own worst critic. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I, I just I I know that artists like really appreciate the challenge and the growth, mm -hmm. you know, and because you guys are all you all have that thing in you yeah. to produce something beautiful for people to see. Yeah. And you know I. I just I don't know how else to say that, but that's a, that's a common thread with the artist. So, the, is the resin process going to be just the same as the bronze? Um, the only thing that I can think of that would be different is how you attach things. So, mm -hmm. if you're doing bronze, you just weld things together. If you have to do something separate, mm -hmm. um, if you're doing a resin, it's going to be a lot harder to attach things. And if you do attach things, you might have a nasty, ugly seam. So uh -huh. if you look at this sculpture by John Coleman, uh -huh. you can see where maybe typically he might have a gap in between the hand and the piece pipe. It's wow. filled in. So everything can be cast as one whole uh, piece and there's uh -huh. nothing that needs to be attached later on. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so uh, is resin done quick? Is this done at a foundry? You can. Okay. One you. great thing about doing a resin is you don't need a, you don't need a foundry. You can do it all 
you know, in your studio. Uh -huh. The only problem is that sometimes the resins are kind of got nasty fumes and things like that. Oh, okay. So uh, a well ventilated. Yeah, you area. probably want to be well ventilated outside. But other than that, you don't. It's it's a faster process. Um, you can do it at your at your own studio. You don't need to send it off to a foundry, mm -hmm. and it takes less time. Very good. Okay, and are there different colors of resin? Yeah. Like, is this just a natural resin color? There are so many different colors. It's it, you wouldn't even believe it. You can you can even have they have bronze powder that you can put inside of your resin, uh -huh. and it'll it won't feel necessarily like a bronze, but it will look a lot like a bronze. Wow. And uh, so you can do it red. You can do it green. You can make it look like it's a marble. This actually looks to me like a marble and I got up close to it. I was like, it's a resin? I didn't know that. So yeah, uh, you can do a lot of things with the resins. Um, so why bronze? Why is bronze the most, I mean, I guess, is that the only metal that statues no. are cast? So you can do nickel, you can do, uh, you can do aluminum, mm -hmm. you can even do iron cores. The reason we use bronze is it's it's durable. It lasts for a long time. We have bronze things from the Bronze Age. Yeah, <laughs> well, true. That's yeah, true. They, they do. They last things. a while. Yeah, they. It's very. It's very. Uh, it's very long lasting. Uh -huh. Another thing that I've read, and I'm not sure somebody can fact check me on this, is that right before bronze cools down, it's it it slightly expands and then it slightly shrinks a little bit, and because of that expansion it can get into like the, cre the cracks and crevices a lot uh, easier uh -huh. and it flows really nicely when it's and it's poured into the the ceramic or the ceramic shell right so it has a bunch of properties that lends itself to being the casting of choice and then on top of that you can do different patinas with other things mm -hmm. um, so i think bronze takes patinas a little bit better than, than maybe some other metals that might be something you can fact check me on too right maybe. right but well, that I mean, that makes a lot of sense. But it just kind of occurred to me. Yeah. You were talking about the bronze. I thought, yeah. I wonder why. So that I mean, those things make a lot of sense. Okay, so we're going to go look at a few more um, sculptures. So hang on, take your Dramamine if you get motion sick, because <laughs> we might be. we might cause a little bit of that. <laughs> okay. This is a Bob Scriber and what's the name of this? Let's read the, the front of it real quick. Lay in the trap. Lay in the trap. Uh, and uh, he's another member of the Cowboy Hearts of America. Uh, you guys have got a bunch of those guys in here. So that's that's really good. A lot of those guys are really well thought of in, uh -huh. in, uh, in Western art. So are you are you a member of organizations? I'm a member of the National Sculpture Society. Okay. So it's a pretty big deal for me. I'm happy about that. Uh, so do, it's not like you pay your dues and you get to be in it. No, you get a, they vote you in. Very uh, nice. I got rejected like maybe four or five times, but you know, well, I finally got in. <laughs> good for you for yeah. sticking it out. I yeah. mean, seriously, I, you know, those are, those are things that I don't always know about. So, okay. Talk to us about this scriber. Yeah. So uh, from what I've read, he, he didn't start sculpting until he was about 46 and that's not uncommon for sculptors. A lot of sculptors don't start off as sculptors. That's their second career. Uh, one of the sculptors I've met before, uh, 
he said he didn't start sculpting. He spent most of his life as a, as a commercial airline pilot. And then as his second career, he was a sculptor. So he had a whole wow. other career for a while and was wow. a sculptor afterwards. Or is crazy. a sculptor now. That's crazy. And uh, one thing that I really enjoyed about this was the unconventional kind of layout of it. If, if you probably can't, you probably can't tell, but you probably can maybe is it's almost an or it is in a zigzag uh -huh. and we've got two cowboys roping a roping a a bull or steer you know, we're gonna <laughs> find out <laughs> yeah that's a steer <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this nice kind of zigzag that really accentuates the action so we've got like the action here then it comes to like a really sudden and sharp stop and then it zags over here and then it moves over here. So the artist is encouraging you to move with the artwork instead of having you just stay in one spot. You're, you're following those zigzags in order to get you to move around the artwork. Mm -hmm. And I, so with, with, the, with sculpture, that is the goal. Yeah. You really want people to move and see the whole thing from every side. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're putting all the work into the yeah. every side of it, so. Yeah, you're trying, to, even with painting, you're trying to get the art, or the viewer to move their eye around the painting. Mm -hmm. uh, with sculpture, you're trying to get the viewer to move their eye around the sculpture. And no matter what kind of artwork you're doing, you're trying to get that eye to move because if you don't get that eye to move, you're not gonna generate the interest to have somebody you know examine your work a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that you know I feel like every sculptor tries to do. And I really like his motion, mm -hmm. getting your eye to move. And so much texture. Yes. I mean this this rough terrain here that yes. they are riding on. Yeah. It honestly it looks like mud or something yeah mud and dust and just everything yeah yeah, yeah. it's it is a, so much detail i i feel like i'm going to have a whole new eye and appreciation for sculpt sculpting now yeah than i had before i mean you're really uh educating us a lot today with Quincy. this is very good so all the little bro i don't know well you guys can see that's yeah. a that's a rope the cowboys roped the steer by the um, horns here, and then the the bridles, the reins. Those are probably things that they came back and added. Yeah. Right. More than likely, from what it looks like, those are strips of bronze that are welded on there, and then for the rope, it looks like those are two uh, bronze wires that are uh -huh. wrapped around each other and welded into the the hands of the the riders. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I think this is a rodeo arena. Look, the, this yeah, guy has a yeah, number on is. his back. Yeah, you're right. So at first I thought that, you know, they were out on the range, but I think this is a rodeo arena. Yep. And they are, and that is exactly what the dirt and everything looks like, isn't it? Yep. So do you ever, um, I, all of a sudden it occurred to me, this could be like the idea from a photograph. Mm -hmm. You know where the the dirt and everything is kicked up. Have you ever worked from a photograph? Um, I do work from photographs. I use a lot of reference materials. So one thing that I did as a teacher is I always told my students, "Don't see a picture, draw a picture. Don't see a picture, paint a picture." Mm -hmm. um, I would always tell them to take at least three references or three sources, and then merge them together to make it your own. Uh, that's kind of what I try to do. I don't, I don't see a picture, sculpt a picture. I try to take from different resources or different sources. Mm -hmm. And if I'm using things and, and meld them into one thing, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't typically just see something. Useful. Well, because honestly, a picture is two dimensional anyway. Mm -hmm. And so even if this was inspired by a picture, of a rodeo happening you still have the back side of everything yeah. you know that he that he the sculptor had to take from here and and make uh, yeah. make it into the the finished product yeah so very cool all right let's move down i was talking about will rogers earlier and we have and this <laughs> 
this piece is very impressive to me. I'm gonna let you talk about it uh, first, but. So this is Will Rogers and it's by Harold Holden. Harold Holden is a, an a Oklahoma sculptor. He's an Oklahoma sculptor. He's a part of the Cowboy Arts of America. He's also part of the National Sculpture Society. He's also in the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. So he, he's, a, he's a pretty accomplished uh, person. He's and still yep, living. Yep. Um, this is a Will Rogers, uh, obviously. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the, the maquette for the one that's uh, the life or the large one that's outside the airport in Oklahoma City, Will Rogers Airport. Oh. So. Uh, that is possible. Yeah. Uh, very possible. The thing that's so impressive to me is that this face mm -hmm. actually looks like Will Rogers. Yeah. You can actually tell that it is him. Yeah. And um, that seems like kind of a big deal that he was able to not just make a face, but make Will Rogers' face. Yeah. He's you know? a very accomplished uh, sculptor. He's done <laughs> uh, governor's, uh, the governor's portrait in, I think it was David Warren's he did in the Oklahoma State Capitol, if I'm not mistaken. So, so he, he paints? No, he sculpted. Oh, he sculpted. Yeah, they have like that hall of yeah, the, the bust. Yeah. yeah, so he did at least one of those yes. then. He did that. He's also done some paintings inside the state capitol. Uh, he's got monuments all over Oklahoma. Uh, I believe they have, I think he has one in Oklahoma State for the plane that went down. Oh, they yeah. just had that, uh, the anniversary. I always think that's a terrible yeah. word, but the remembrance day yeah. of that event, it was because it happened in January. Yeah. So yeah. he's, he's very accomplished and he's one of the sculptors, Leonard McMurray and Paul Moore and Harold Holden. And those are the three guys you're probably gonna see the most probably around in Oklahoma. Mm. I'm going to have to get those names from you because <laughs> next week, I've, I mean, I've got a, information on a couple of them, but I'm going to do a, a trail talk about Oklahoma sculptors mm -hmm. next week. Yeah. And so um, I was already going to talk about Alan Hauser and um, uh, Black Bear Boson. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with him? Have you ever heard of him? I think he only has like one big sculpture that he uh, did. Um, but anyway, so yeah. I was uh, looking at some some uh, other people, some yeah. Paul Moore. Yeah. I'm, I you know, guys know him. Yeah. We know Paul Moore, yeah, <laughs> yeah. around here because he's done some stuff. So that is so cool that that's the maquette mm -hmm. for that bigger piece. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to uh, go check that out too. Oh, I've got so much to do now, so much to <laughs> learn. All right, one final piece that we're going to uh, look at here. All right, very good. So this is a grant speed and I'm gonna, the title's kind of long, so I'm gonna read it for you guys. Riders in the distance add to the risk of cattle rustling. So this is a sculpture by obviously Grant Speed. He's also another member of the National Sculpt, not the National Sculpture Society, but the, the Cowboy Artists of America. Uh, he started out as uh, an elementary school teacher. He was also in the Air Force. He was, elementary school, he was an elementary school teacher or teacher in general for a decade plus and wow. was sculpting in the evenings and eventually you know, transitioned to being a, a full-time artist. Uh, one interesting fact about that, we talked about additions earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an addition of this at the Murrah building and when the Murrah building was uh, was bombed and attacked, they were they lost several sculptures or not sculptures, but artworks in general. They lost, they couldn't find, or they thought were completely destroyed. And this was one of them. A uh, few weeks later, after they they made that announcement, they actually found uh, their addition that's up at the Murrah building. They found their addition, and it was underneath the uh, the stairs. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what condition it was in or anything like that, but I do know that it survived. Yeah, it so. survived that. Wow, that is a very cool. And it was this very same piece. Yeah, um, a different edition. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that is that's a very cool uh, little tidbit to yeah. know that some of these things, um, you know, it'd be great for us to know whenever we have uh, visitors here, we can add to the information that we share. So I love it, LaQuincy, that you've 
you know, found a lot of this information and uh, shared it with us today. It's really good stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, very cool. That's Sabana who refuses to come on camera, but um, she's, we love her and she's very helpful. <laughs> um, so, uh, La Quincy, now I haven't uh, talked about this yet, but you have a new adventure that you are going to be starting, I guess, uh, this next weekend. You're moving into the a studio at the Skirvin Hotel. Yep. Is that correct? You want to tell us about that? So the Skirvin Hotel, along with the Paseo Arts Association, they have a program at the Skirvin Hotel where they have an artist in residence. And what that means is they give a studio to the artist at the hotel and they get to work uh, in the hotel and that's their studio. Uh -huh. And I'm the next artist that's going to be there. Um, and I'll be moving in this weekend. And the very first person that's going to get a preview and, and visit me at my studio is Edie. Ooh, yeah. I'm so excited. And, and Edie's going to bring Savannah. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> <laughs> And she's, she's also going to bring Mary, yeah, Bailey. Yeah. <laughs> and Tina. And Tina, I'm sorry. Road trip. Don't leave yeah. Road trip. Road trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, how long will you be there? I'll be there for seven months. Uh -huh. And that'll be my studio. And I'll be working there. I'll be doing uh, community engagement. I've got several things that I've kind of, once I get moved in, I'll put in the works. Uh, I've been interviewing people kind of like what you do, but uh, I interviewed uh, Darcy Reeves oh. at the Chisholm Trail uh, Arts, Arts Council. Arts, Arts Council, I'm uh -huh. here with the Arts Council. Uh, also interviewed Amanda Bleakley at the Paseo Arts Association and another artist. And uh, I'll be doing those kinds of things, kind of like what you're doing mm -hmm. at my studio there as well. Awesome. I, I can't wait. I think that, and you, this will be on a YouTube channel. Yes. Is how, that's how uh, people could yeah. uh, watch that. Yeah. So um, we'll be able to uh, maybe we'll, we'll get up details if yeah. we, uh, uh, whenever those become available. So LaQuincy, this has just been such a fun episode of Trail Talk. I mean, literally when I said I have learned so much, well, obviously I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I didn't know even the simplest of terms whenever it came to the uh, things about sculpting, but I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot. And uh, we can't wait because 2023, you're going to be one of the featured artists here. Yep. at the Heritage Woo! Center. So yeah, we are super excited about that. So um, it, anyway, we're, we can't wait to see what the future holds for you. It'll be a great time. And I'm looking forward to visiting with you guys the next week mm -hmm. and then in the future. Yeah. And you know, uh, one thing he's not telling us this information about these well-known artists, these sculptors, someday someone's going to be talking about La Quincy Reed like that. I mean, how cool is that to think about? That'd be kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see that. That's on the horizon out there, man. That's going to happen. We're, we're, we're excited. Well, thank you. Yeah, so um, when it's uh, time to sign off, we always say happy trails together. Okay. So you ready? Yeah. Okay. We'll see you guys next time. Happy trails. Happy trails.